it appears as though they may have funded the Nazi movement with those possessions and valuables. Well, I don't know whether they funded the entire movement, but let it be known that that uh, November 9th was exceedingly well planned down to the minutest detail, including money and possessions, etc. I might tell you that, for example, my family, my mother, the last few months before we were able to come to the United States, uh, was not allowed to take but a minimal amount of our account from the bank. I mean, there was nothing left to chance. Just think of, of here in our country, how it would be if one day your hopefully big bank account, you can take out $20 a month or $50 a month. It's my money. And how did they do that? Oh, they, it, they passed laws. Everything was legitimate. Uh -huh. So that was the Nuremberg Laws in That's 1935. It. Yes, but act yes, in 1935, and one of the things, for example, saying that nothing was left to chance, that you, a Jew uh, was a man in the home, could not engage a maid, because Europeans had maids, under the age of 45, because then maybe she would no longer be able to bear children. And after all, you know that every Jewish man abuses a Gentile woman. So that was another form of propaganda. Yeah. Well, and but it was a fact. We had to let our wonderful Fräulein Elsa, Miss Elsa, go because she was not 45 yet. Oh. And actually, they started quite young in the grade school with some of the primers that they were uh, teaching the children the anti-Semitism. Yes. They, uh, they had the Hitler Youth that started very early. And as a funny aside, I had a, my brother that you, we talked about before. He was particularly handsome and blonde and blue-eyed, which you know, Jews are all dark and swarthy, of course. And he was playing in the park. And some man came to him and said, why aren't you in a Hitler uniform? And he said, because I'm a Jew. And he said, you can't be a Jew. Jews don't look like you. So there you are. So it just shows how wrong you can be. Yes, he was blonde and blue-eyed. <laughs> so in 1933, 34, and 35, they passed a series of about 400 laws that gradually eroded your civil rights. Absolutely. And it started by removing Jewish people from their jobs, such yes. as teachers. Teachers, yes. I, the school that I went to, uh, after a while when I couldn't bear any more going to the school where I mentioned those awful incidents, I then went to a Jewish school that had existed for many years, but uh, it sounds strange to say, but the German Jews who were emancipated and assimilated and lived a more, uh, a less religious life perhaps, we didn't go to that school. Well, all of a sudden that school got a huge influx of children and teachers. The teachers were both. Uh, either they were Jewish teachers who had been, as you mentioned, let go, um, from other schools in other cities and were just desperately looking for a job. They had taught at general schools. And we had some incredibly wonderful teachers who were politically not sorry for the Nazis. They weren't Nazis, they were communists. And life is ironic. Our wonderful teacher that taught history and Schiller and Goethe and, and math, and which I was very bad, and his professor Menzel, who was a communist, and at the end of the war, he was the first mayor of my city of Leipzig because he had been a communist. Because by that time, Leipzig was on the east and the socialist side. And professor, there's a street named after my teacher. Hmm. And Hitler was anti-communist. Of, of course. Because he was a socialist. Well, he was, he, the party was called, uh, I have to see if I can translate it. NSDAP, NSDAP, I know that you uh, know about that. It was called the National Socialist Democratic Workers' Party. Some dem democracy, as you can see. Mm -hmm. Tell you how detailed they were. I belonged to a Zionist Girl Scout group. And we had blue shirts with little ties. You know, when you know, those of you who have girls, are Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts, Blue was the color of the communists. It was the communist flag. 
we had to change, and all of a sudden, all of us got green shirts. I mean, it's petty, but it's telling how they involve themselves in the minutest detail of everybody's life. Right. And how do you think they financed that whole movement to be so organized? I can't really tell you that. I have answers for lots of things, but I don't know that. I know that in later years, in the, during the years when the, uh, the uh, concentration camps really flourished, if I can use that term, that when people died, they pulled the teeth and the gold and, and, and used that for their armaments, etc. But th when you spoke in your introduction about those three concentration camps, one was very close to where I lived, it might be of interest to, to be accurate is that men were, n women were not uh, put in camps at that time, men were uh, uh, taken, and if they had proof that they had an exit visa to America, to Cuba, to Shanghai, they were at that time still let go. I do recall that a few weeks after November 9th, I was in the hospital because my mother, it shows how crazy the thinking was, or not, not really quite what we, how it used to be. My mother knew I had some problems with my appendix, and she thought we wouldn't have money to have an operation in America. So I had a preventive appendix operation, which I didn't need. Uh, but what I saw, it was three, four weeks after Kristallnacht, many men came to that Jewish hospital because they suffered from frostbites and other things that happened in camps. They had no blankets, they slept on wooden benches, and I, some of my dear friends and my parents' friends, I saw them returning very worn out, hurt. Traumatized. And traumatized. Yes, yeah. not, not quite the same person. No, and no they were person. not allowed to talk about their experience yes, in the yes, camps. Of course not. So in the beginning, in 1933, which is when they first started with the concentration camps, um, they actually let the prisoners out, but they were not quite themselves. No, no, this is a terrible, a, terrible right. ex experience. I know that my husband's family was let go. He, the father, his father was let go because he had, my husband had uh, found a visa for Cuba. I don't know how many Americans know that Cuba took in some German Jews. It's, uh, it's strange. And Shanghai had a burgeoning group of German Jews and uh, today if you go to Shanghai you will see that the synagogue has been rebuilt and people lived as a community until the end of the war. And actually most of the countries around the world were not that friendly to taking in Jewish refugees. No, for sure not. England was an exception. Yes, there was by the way, it doesn't, it has nothing to do with Kristallnacht, but there was something that was established from Germany, was called the Children's Transport, and many German Jewish children, and with their parents' hearts breaking, sent their kids, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, to England to survive the war and live. Mm -hmm. Many, many. There is a group that still gets together of the children's transport. That would certainly be a difficult decision to make. For a parent. But in the end, it saved their lives. It absolutely saved And them. many of the parents perished. Yes, they, they did, they did, yes. Some were taken, and they were not only taken, and I need to say that because we say negative things, it, they were taken in pri primarily by Christian families in England who were kind and understanding. So on Kristallnacht, let's, um, Tell us what that day was like for you. You got up, you went to school, your mother already... I didn't go to school. You went on the streetcar? Yes, but the day before, a few of us were together and we had heard about this, uh, even though before television and whatever it was, but we must have heard it on the radio, that this Herschel Greenspan had uh, killed the uh, man in, uh, at the German embassy in, in Paris, and we heard that something terrible was going to happen. And by the way, I do recall that episode with the Polish Jews because if it was just a few weeks before the 9th of November that uh, uh, many of the Polish Jews uh, were put in a, on a train and sent to the border of Poland. 
um, so they were deported. They were deported, except the Poles didn't. This is our history. The Poles didn't want us either. So they were German Jews no. of Polish descent. No, no. They were Polish Jews of living po in Germany. Yes, that's a better way to and put it. And the Germans deported them without, to get rid of them without notice. Without cause. Back to Poland. Poland. And the Poles didn't want them. So they, they sent were them right stuck back. in the middle. And so I remember that my mother, I don't know where my mother was. Uh, oh, she was in Berlin at the American consulate for our visa. Hallelujah, that wonderful visa. Um, and I got a phone call that uh, there are a whole bunch of people that have come back to my hometown, and they, didn't, they, are, they weren't really from my hometown. They had no place. And could, I, could we take some people? And I took out my mother's best linen and everything and found pillows and blankets, and we had... We had a very large apartment. We had maybe seven, eight people sleeping until they found a different place for themselves. I mean, it, it was so, everything was so incredibly uncertain. Not mm. only vicious, but uncertain. Right. So when the Jewish communities had a sense of doom and foreboding, why didn't more people leave? That's a good question. It's um, when we listen to... Uh, the television here and people say, say that and then everybody always says that. that's a really good question. Mm. It's a good question. And we're talking primarily about German Jews. I think that the German Jew by and large did not expect what was going to happen. They felt reasonably secure. They thought this would be a passing, certainly not fancy, horror. And it would never come to what actually Hitler had clearly written in his book, which, of course, none of us ever read. It was so vicious and so unbelievable what was in store for us that there are people who were, who were worried about money. We're human beings. And uh, this, I think, holds true particularly for the German Jew because he had been... In, better, in a better position financially and, and had also been more part of the culture of the country, contrary to some people from on the East, Poland, Russia, etc., who had lived more densely Jewish and sometimes even ghettoized uh, lives uh, historically. Mm -hmm. it, but it is a question. I know a number of people that I think we would have been able they would have been able to come. It can't be. They can't be. And I owe real estate. And it can't be. It w it'll pass. Mm -hmm. Well, it would certainly be hard to imagine what was to come. It's, uh, yes. Uh, and actually, some of the Jewish men who were targeted on Kristallnacht were heroes uh, in, in World War I. They fought for Germany. Yes. I, I shared uh, with you at some time that I had an opportunity to go back to my hometown some 10, 12 years ago, and I took my eldest daughter. And we went to the cemetery, which was not destroyed, one of the few that was not destroyed. And my, I have a picture of my daughter who's standing next to her great-grandmother's and great-great-grandfather's uh, grave. Uh, after She's named after my uh, grandmother. And we looked around, and we saw all kinds of names we knew. But what my daughter, who is uh, past middle age now for sure, what got to her and disturbed her and moved her to tears is that in this cemetery there was and still is a uh, big uh, stone something with, with names on it. And on top it says, the gratitude of the fatherland is, is yours for sure. It's a bad translation. And underneath 